for Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulikai. Author Brian Potro joins me to unpack the book titled Comro's Legacy, Research and Development of Stopping Mining Machinery and Technologies. Welcome, Brian. Your book details the legacy of research organization and the Chamber of Mines of South Africa, or COMRO, which developed many technologies to benefit the industry. So can you briefly give us some insight into the organization's beginning? Yes, the uh, coal mining industry really started in the late uh, 1800s when they discovered uh, gold in Johannesburg. And uh, that uh, started an influx of people, uh, <laughs> investors, entrepreneurs, and even shopkeepers, suppliers. So the, uh, the industry started then. And what actually happened is uh, a loosely formed chamber of mines was established, uh, three founding members. And the object was to form a cooperative to look after the, the growing industry uh, in terms of supply mm. and so forth. And it was formally uh, established as the Chamber of Mines in 1889. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was established as this cooperative to look after the interests of its members. Mm -hmm. So like any uh, cooperative, it had these three initial founding members and uh, they then looked at uh, supplying infrastructure to enable the industry to grow. Other members joined the chamber and it expanded rapidly because they discovered uh, the gold fields uh, all in South Africa extending from Clarkstop in the west to Evanda in the east to Welcome and of course you had uh, the Rand with uh, Johannesburg and um, what actually happened as the industry growed it uh, uh, had increasing problems as they went deeper into the mines and so heat became a problem as did uh, rock failure underground so there were a lot of uh, rock bursts for instance and in the 1950s, there were daily occurrences in uh, Johannesburg, for instance, eventually. But at that time, it was uh, established as the Chamber of Mines of South Africa. It, it went through various name changes. But um, as the industry grew, then it had increasing problems. And eventually, in the 1960s, um, it, it was decided that because of the increasing fatalities because of heat stroke and the increasing problems associated with rock bursts, the industry didn't have a full knowledge on how to tackle it. So they then decided to embark on a, a research program. Individual minds were doing their own research, but it was often very ad hoc and there was no continuity and it depended on uh, what issues they saw in the company. But then they decided uh, to form the uh, Chamber of Mines Research Organization under the umbrella of the Chamber of Mines. They had already uh, were offering services to its members because they had increasing members and the members some of them were Anglo-American, JCI, established names, and they were already p supplying services to them, like the employment of labor, the hospitals, the refineries, because there were similar problems which each of the members were facing. Similarly, with the Chamber of Mines Research Organization, they were all having problems with uh, the increasing heat, with depth, and the actual uh, problems associated with rock failures. That's how it in initially started the Chamber of Mines Research Organization. And what did the research program entail? Well, it entailed first of obviously looking at heat and uh, rock uh, failures, 
an understanding about rock engineering and the increasing temperature because uh, the temperature was causing heat strokes and rock failures obviously affected the safety and health of the workers. So the program really was looking at not just rock engineering and uh, heat but also looking at uh, productivity because the mining method, for instance, of drill and blast was not very productive because workers have to be removed from the mine when the conventional method of drill and blast was taking place. So it encompassed all the issues, really, the research programme, which were affecting the industry as a whole. And the industry really decided on the program that the Chamber of Mines would implement on their behalf. And of course, as a private organization, the Chamber, through its members, which are the gold mines, funded the research program. And that's how it initially started. But they had the position of research advisor available at the Chamber, but it was never filled. So in the 1960s, uh, they appointed someone to fill that position and to guide the industry on the development of the program. Because a lot of the mining houses were actually doing their own thing and they then took this to these laboratories which they had and they combined it under one roof, basically to form the Chamber of Mines Research Organization and the program. So it looked at all factors of safety and health, improving productivity of the industry, because uh, the mining, because it, was, it wasn't a continuous mining like drill and blast, it was interrupted by the fact that when blasting occurred, fumes were generated, obviously, and the people, the miners, the workers had to be taken out of the mine to surface for blasting to occur. And then the following day, other miners were taken down to clean the blasted rock. So unlike the coal mines, which were, had machines continuously mining, so that's why productivity was addressed as well. And the book is a compilation of achievements told by others that give a complete picture of what mining operations in a deep gold mine could look like today and in the near future. So what do you think is South Africa's current state of mining operations, particularly when <coughs> looking at research and development? Well, when the chamber was closed in 1990s, okay. and it was not closed really, it was decided to merge it with the CSAR, which was the government science council and uh, it continued at the CSR for a while, a short while and other programs were tried over that time in collaboration with the industry but uh, the circumstances of the industry changed as well, the gold price didn't increase a great deal, working costs were increasing so research more or less came to a a stop. Yeah, you know, it, it, it wasn't continued at uh, CSAR. Chamber of Mines lost a lot of the staff, for instance, about 60% of the staff. Uh, a lot of people started their own companies, for instance, using knowledge from the chamber. So um, research uh, declined rapidly into mining. But uh, I understand in the last four years, various attempts have been made to establish um, a center at uh, the University of Johannesburg for sustainable mining. And I believe that is going to look at research into mining. I understand that it will take place fairly soon. But uh, it'll be financed by one or a couple of the mining ho houses. But uh, the mining industry has decreased rapidly with time. 
So I'm not sure what the outcome will be. Although some mining companies are doing ad hoc investigations or improvements as they occur on the mines, for instance. And what were some of the things that surprised you when you were compiling this book? Because you described Comro as a cement that created lasting friendships. Well, I think I was surprised, first of all, because the book is an anthology. There's different contributors mm -hmm. to the book. And what surprised me is um, the people I approached, although they were now spread throughout the world, where when the chamber was established, all these people were drawn in from all over the world. So these people I contacted could actually contribute. For 30, 40 years later, they still had photographs, they still had the knowledge, mm -hmm. they, they still rem remembered the, the challenges we faced. Because at the time there was a lot of pressure on us uh, put up by the mining industry be because the gold price was so low and working costs were increasing rapidly. So in the late 1980s, for instance, some mines were not making a profit. So there was huge pressure on us to develop this new technology. And uh, the friendships developed at that time were quite substantial because when I, I joined from the UK, for instance, I was recruited from the UK, I knew nothing about mining. So when you go into a gold mine at two and a half kilometers underground, it's quite frightening. You know, it's uh, quite a <laughs> it can be a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. So it, it brought us very close together as a team because you had these people from Australia, some people from other parts of the world, and we were pushed underground really to mm -hmm. develop this technology. So we formed these close relationships, which many of us are still in contact with and still friends. And why is it that you and some of the contributors to the book felt that the period from mid-1970s uh, to late 1980s was the most significant period for the industry? Well, when the Chamber of Mines Research Organization was established in 1964, it was given a budget. And uh, the budget actually looked at productivity, safety and health and such like. But as the gold price deteriorated and working costs increased, productivity took uh, a key problem which needed to be addressed. Mm. So in 1974, the industry actually committed itself to increasing the budget substantially because the, we tried taking coal mining machinery and we put it underground and instead of lasting for two million, five million tons of coal, it lasted for 30,000 tons of rock. So we took these various coal mining machinery, put it underground, and it didn't last in the severe conditions in a gold mine. The rock quartzite in which the gold reef is found is, is about more nine, eight and nine on uh, the scale, the more, the hardness scale. So it's just less than diamond. So it's very, very abrasive. So it's so totally different to coal. And the underground environment is hot and it's highly corrosive. A lot of water is used, so it's highly humid. It's like a sauna, basically, underground. You know, so you imagine being in a sauna with uh, all this abrasive rock, so the machines wore out very quickly. And so it was decided by the industry we would need to develop our own machines. So that required a substantial increasing cost to develop these machines. Because we didn't build machines, so we actually had contracts with all the top mining companies manufacturers in the world to develop these machines, for instance. And that's how the budget was increased substantially and how people came in. 
So in 76, for instance, I was part of this influx. So the Chamber of Research uh, changed from 400 people eventually to over 700 people to address this problem. And briefly discuss with us how the research organization's changing fortunes may have impacted the implementation of some of other innovative technologies that are not fully developed? Well, when uh, it was decided in the late 1980s to reduce the budget of the chamber because certain of the mines were no longer profitable, they felt that um, rather than close the chamber of mines research, Comro, rather than close it, that uh, to investigate whether that uh, knowledge and really the patents developed and the staff could be uh, integrated into the CSAR. So that was the approach taken. But the, br the reduction in, in the budget was dramatic. It went down from 70 million to 30 million in a couple of years, two years. So a lot of the staff left, a lot of the projects were stopped and uh, a lot of the expensive projects were the manufacture of machines, mining machinery. So certain of the developments were stopped before they were implemented and commercialized for the industry. So the book highlights the fact of indicating those innovative uh, technologies were prematurely stopped because they weren't continued in the CSAR, for instance. A lot of the rock mechanics were continued at the CSAR and other involvements, but the actual building of machines, designing and building and testing and evaluating machines underground, which was often five to ten year process, was stopped. And of course, uh, a lot of these ideas were captured in the book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And lastly, Brian, what are you aiming to achieve with this book? Do you think it could be used to improve current mining operations? Yeah, definitely. If people want to start mining, improve productivity, they have to look at uh, some of the knowledge and machinery uh, which were developed. That, look, the industry is currently using some of the technology. Like we uh, we developed the concept of operating machines on water, which was a new technique. And the concept of hydropower, you can use the, the head of water, the gravity of water, to drive machines. And because it's uh, chilled water, it actually cools the mine at the same time. So this was really groundbreaking technology and it is being applied on some of the current gold mines. So the industry knows about this technology, but it doesn't know about some of the other technology because it's so long ago, you know, it's like 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. So uh, a lot of people like myself are old you know, no longer working in the industry, say, or and some of the younger people may not know of these developments which took place at that time. And also, some of them could be because of new developments which have taken place in technology with uh, like AI and things like this and miniaturization. A lot of the developments which at the time were possibly difficult to develop because of a lack of application of suitable engineering solutions, they could be solved now with existing knowledge. Uh, so that's another reason for it. And I think a key aspect was that we developed uh, a unique way of uh, handling research and development. It was called research, development, evaluation, trial, application. And that process we developed through experience. 
So if anyone's looking at getting involved in developing that technology, the book and how research was handled would be very important knowledge for them. That was Brian Pothro speaking to Crimea Media's Polity about Comro's legacy, research and development of stopping mining machinery and technologies.